The night brims with anticipation. A symphony of shadows, whispering secrets only the rain-slick streets can translate. They flock here to this hallowed ground of flickering neon and forgotten dreams, drawn like moths to a flickering flame. The film board gathers, and tonight we exhume the celluloid corpses of cinema past and dissect the cinematic soul of its present. Tonight the shadows hold a particular chill, for we delve into the world painted black, first by James O'Barr and given life on the silver screen by Brandon Lee and Bill Skarsgård after him. We speak, of course, of the crow. Joining me tonight, three souls brave enough to walk with me through this gothic avian landscape. One who needs no introduction, a legend who brings Eric Draven to life with a haunting intensity each time he dons his fishnet shirt. Matthew Fox. It can't rain all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Though I am in Seattle now, so it's weird for me to say that, because apparently oh, here it feel, does. You can feel it coming. Next, a rising star, who, rumor has it, is set to take on the mantle of the crow in his own upcoming remake, ready to carve his legend into the night. Ocean Murph. Uh, mother is the name for God on the lips of all children. Amen, brother. <laughs> yes. And lastly, a scholar of the macabre, a guide through the dark mythology of the crow and its many incarnations, Justin J.J. Yeager. <laughs> Let our seance begin. What's the first thing you liked about me? I thought that you were quite brilliantly broken. You feel like my person? <laughs> you feel like my person. What's the worst thing you've ever done? I saw things. I shouldn't have seen any of it. Someone dies. A crow carries a soul to the land of the dead. And sometimes something so bad happens that the soul cannot rest. Until you put the wrong things right. You were given the power of a god. But you're running out of time to save her. I'm gonna kill them. Every single one of them. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Crow, a very special edition. Um, we're, we're talking about The Crow. We're not just talking about The Crow, The Skarsgård Crow, The Scars Crow. We're also talking about the original Crow 1994. So 1994 to 2024. Uh, let's go around the room and do some opening thoughts. Now, I'm going to say this was actually Matthew's idea to Thank do you, this Matthew. crossover. Thank That's you, fantastic. Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Therefore, I believe the honor to go first should go. Oh boy, to Matt. <laughs> this might get rough, folks. Go to Matthew Fox. So let me start by saying I was a goth in high school. Um, nice. By which I mean, like, I did wear a lot of black. I did listen to a lot of that music. I I was an honorable, you know, responsible, respectable adult even as a teenager. So it had very little to do with how much I liked the way girls dressed in black fishnet. But like, it, you know, I, it was a culture I was very enamored with. And this movie was like definitional to us. And I have. And so I went in expecting not to like it, but expecting to be like, it's not going to be the 1994 movie. It's going to be OK. It's going to be something different. And the opening shot was in sunlight. And I was like, what the hell is happening here? That's already <laughs> broken. <laughs> and I spent the first like 10 or 15 minutes being like, this is so wrong. But it's OK. It's a different movie. It's a totally different thing. That's okay. And we're kind of trying to find the good in it. And then I walked outside and read some reviews. and was like, oh, good. Everyone else thinks it sucks too. It's not just because I like the original. Um, so yeah, I am 
I'm going to do my best not to just be the grumpy old goth in the corner going, oh, in my day, we walked uphill both ways to see never sunlight. And we didn't have <laughs> backstory or lore. We just had a beautiful movie. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm really excited okay. to hear other people's thoughts on it. But I will be giving some, um, you know, th this was my subculture being represented and it was not represented well. Because, because Matthew, what, give, 1994, how old were you? You were, what, what was your year? Uh, so that was my junior. That was uh, my junior year of high school. Okay, I graduated in '95. So '94 would be like spring was I was a sophomore. Uh, I was this was a junior, but it was like on into college. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, all through college, like you know, the 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 goth industrial subset. Everyone was wearing the crow T-shirts. Everyone sure. was quoting it to each other. This was just this movie was definitional of of that mindset. Sure, sure. And we I this was actually one of my fundamental questions for this show because of how I felt about the movie. I thought we might take some time to ask uh in the style of BuzzFeed, are you goth or are you emo? And I think that matters, <laughs> right? Uh for how you feel about this movie. JJ, what's your um what's your place on the crowd? Yeah, I agree completely. And so in 94 I wasn't goth, but I was heavily into comic books and I was very so I was a senior. 94 was my senior year and I I really liked The Crow for what it was in 1994. And watching it back, I went back and watched it back this week, and it actually is a very good comic book movie of the time, right? I mean, you can compare it to early Batman movies. You can compare it to those where there is a lot of cheese, there is a lot of schlock, but it does some things really interestingly, and it really is stylized in a way that's particularly special to its creative idea, which is probably why it has such a great following for those years you're talking about in college. This, uh, the 2022, 24 version, I super liked. <laughs> okay, this movie, okay. This movie was made for me. What? And as, yes. And I, oh my like, God. <laughs> this is going to be a super fun conversation because I'm not goth, but I love how they made the transition into the lore of the IP here. And again, I, I should say, I have never read the Crow comics, but the way that this began the story or taught us the story felt like something new in a way that I could watch. And I think in a really interesting way that I want to get into and talk about is the juxtaposition of what the Crow in 1994 was to comic book movies as the crow in 2024 is to comic book movies and how they are they should work for different reasons but you have a frenetic pace in the first one and you have an uneven but pace with tons of room here which i found very interesting and very different and the one thing that i do want to say that i definitely want to talk to, to everyone about here is this is, i am not a a graphic violence person uh, even the amount of gun foo in the first crow is a little much for me but this movie that i saw today is the most fun i've had with graphic violence <laughs> since the first kingsman movie and i think wow. i think it could be better if you're objective about what's happening and so i want to get into all that and i'm excited to have the conversation with you guys. i am open to be swayed jay i am open to be swayed by your enthusiasm uh ocean are you where are you what what team did wow. you take? I know. Okay, I am just, my my mouth is literally a gape. Is right. it a gape so like I, that one guy with this who ate that katana? Is it a gape like it, that guy? It, it's a oh, ew, it's a gape like that guy. It's, uh, yeah. How, okay. um, so, so ocean before you start, sure. I want to say to answer Pete's question. Oh yes, please, clearly I'm emo. <laughs> so <laughs> now go ahead. And, and I I would just add to that, and I'm, ocean. I'm sorry, just to play off on that further. Every now, I, I think there's a lot of great things that have come out of emo culture. Every now and then, me and some of my old goth friends are like, oh, emo is just our ugly redheaded stepchild. And I definitely, was 10 minutes in this movie, I was like, oh, this is what happens when emos remake the goth movie. That's exactly now I get what, it. yes. Okay, perfect. Ocean. Okay, well. Well, first um, of all, how old were you when this, when 94 came out? Well, Give us exactly, context. Uh, yes, unlike these, unlike these children we're podcasting with now, <laughs> I was a, uh, see, my, that was my junior year in college. Um, right. And I, you know, I saw the movie, loved the, the Brandon Lee movie. I uh, loved it so much, went back and uh, bought the graphic novel, read the graphic novel. I, uh, similarly to JJ, was uh, 
um, into comic books. That's really what, that was really more my introduction to it. Um, you know, why, why I was interested in it. And so, uh, read that, uh, love that. I thought it was, uh, the book was actually, um, darker than the movie. And I, I was, you know, I understood the changes they made because I've actually in anticipation of this, we read the book and recognized, yeah, you can't do the book directly as a movie. I don't know that it would work that in that format, uh, but it's great. And I, um, in answer to the original question, I also, uh, more identify as emo uh, because the emotional impact of the book and the emotional impact of the movie is what uh, what really drew me in and what I loved about it all. And for this movie, I went in thinking, okay, we're going to do a different crow. So let's see, let's see what they do. I'm going to be positive and want to uh, like the movie. And then after watching it, I was I honestly asked, how did this get made? <laughs> and there is, I want to say, I think I can find something wrong with every scene um, in the movie. Like there's like, there's, oh, there is fired. something wrong, I think in every aspect of this movie. And so, um, you know, I, I, while I am also interested in the conversation, I think that, um, yeah, I'm interested in the conversation, but especially the other side, because I, I do want to know who this is for and who would like this. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then additionally, I also along with that, just, you know, kind of what the, what what did was it what did what did I miss? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I think all of you. The have enemy such... of love is not hate. It's doubt. <laughs> it's doubt. That is the most ridiculous line. <laughs> that, is that, that is cold. That is nothing really, down. That is, that is so ridiculous. profound. And, and okay, that, I mean, so even I, the I, even I, the I'm love part. It. I mean, like, uh, did you buy it for a second? Be that they because were, in a movie that tells thing. us that two people in either rehab or massive emotional damage are very much in a place to form lasting emotional bonds. Yes, the idea of love with no doubt whatsoever is the really, oh my God, every mental the therapist I've ever met would have cringed. <laughs> it's a comic book. I, I the idea of the having a mass gun battle outside of an opera is also not realistic, <laughs> but it's really fun. <laughs> I want the soundproofing of that opera room. No, <laughs> no, no, no doubt. That was the loudest. I I, that exactly must have been the loudest opera ever. ever. Yeah. Okay, I want to turn, you guys. Come on. Um, look, I... <laughs> I was uh, I'm I'm the the senior citizen on the show today. I was uh, 20, 94, 22 when the movie came out, and even I loved it. But growing up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, like so, you know, goth kind of originated in the 70s and 80s in the UK and came over here and emo kind of 80s and 90s in started on the East Coast and kind of moved West. So I kind of feel like we got it all. Like I was a massive fan of Bauhaus and Peter Murphy's uh, solo stuff and uh, who else? Susie and the Banshees and The Cure. My God, The Cure. Oh, goodness. But also sunny day real estate and uh rights of spring and who are some other emo bands like my chemical romance like i like really defined my identity around a lot of the music that i was listening to through high school that and so when i saw this movie and i start hearing the music of this movie it put me in a zone that i thought okay this is a movie that i speak the native language i i know the native tongue of the the uh of of this film of the original cure and so the movie I thought was perfectly balanced and written in such a way that gives us a, a pastiche of the the time that holds up today almost as a museum piece of of the emotional resonance of the the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And I love it for that. I love what it stands for. And then I get to this movie and I find I'm not as much an overt antagonist of it as i am a casablanca uh this is a casablanca one star film for me what does that mean uh it's you despise me don't you rick if i gave you any thought i probably would <laughs> i this this movie i found 90 percent of this movie insufferably boring it was some of the worst dialogue worst scripting and i checked my phone in a dark theater four times in this movie. And I am not someone who does that. I was so bored in this. And I saw it in a D box. It was shaking my ass around. And I was still bored to tears until the opera sequence of just exuberant violence. So I, I struggled with the identity of this movie. And I feel like I come from crow people. Right. And, and I'm, I should say, I'm not a, <laughs> a, a graphic novel person. I still feel like 
I come from crow people and I I don't I don't understand the this movie's place. Can we just just real quick give for those who do know the comic, can you give us a uh a just a brief sort of background on what we should know about the comic if anything to to be able to judge source material. Does that it's make sense as a question? Do, mm-hmm. do you want to answer that, Matt? Matt do you want me to? Uh, I, I can give it a shot. I okay. I haven't read the full comic, but I've looked at a lot of it, and I have a lot of friends who talked about it. And the way one person said is this, that the original captures the aesthetic and the vibe of the story. This has more of the actual story itself. Um, but it felt that one, one friend said this felt much more corporate. It felt very polished and like kind of a, a very well produced when the whole thing, I mean, the, the original comic is a lot of kind of like, you know, it's not like the, the black is not like even paint brushes. It's like someone has taken a pencil or a pen and script, you know, just scribbled back and forth to make like blacked out areas. Um, but I think my understanding is that a lot of the story, like a lot more of the backstory of how these two fell in love. It's been somewhat modernized for this, but there is some elements of that that um, you uh, I, I think more of like the craziness of the villains is m- more true to the original. But there being this whole kind of like supernatural aspect to the villains has some some resonance in the comics. Yeah, That's about the, all I know, though. I can't say I'm an expert. Yeah, the, so the graphic novel itself is much more the the villains are the ones from the movie, from the original Brandon Lee movie. Uh, they're random guys. The the relationship has is done similarly to the movie where it's done in back uh, in flashbacks. Uh, the crow, the one main difference, the crow in the comic books does talk to Eric Draven, and then but it is a, a basic straight ahead. He's he's he becomes you know he comes back alive. He doesn't know what he is. He just goes through and he is avenging the wrong that was done, and then the the wrong that that was done was uh, random. And I think that was one of the things that uh, the book has in it that was not portrayed in either movie. In that the the way they were killed and why they were killed in the book is horribly graphic. You could not do that in a movie. Um, yeah, and so, but it was the the way that was done. It was it was a random act of of basically a bunch of guys that were high on drugs and they just decided to then kill and gang rape this woman, and 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 kill her. And so, and also unlike the original movie, uh, Eric lived the thirty hours and then died, uh, where Shelley died right away. And uh, beyond that. That the 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 revenge plot was much more uh, a much more of a straightforward. He was getting back at the people that had had wronged them, and so and so that was that was what it was. And the driving force was much more of his emotional uh, journey of trying to not only really get through. At least for me, I, since I'm I was more emotionally invested in it, it was his journey to get through uh, what he had to do in order to get back to Shelley, because that was all he wanted to do. He wanted to kill these guys and and then get back to Shelley. But I think that's a really important point that uh, I'm sure we'll get into later is that there was nothing noble about what he was doing. It wasn't a, I'm trying to save her from a better place or sacrifice. It was pure anti-hero revenge. And yeah, like, okay. to, to, you know, and like in the movie, the, it, in the comic book, does it have the same way that he kind of saves the family of the the little girl who hangs out with them somewhat? Uh, no, in the, in the comic, the little girl is there, but she's, she's a much more, she's a much more minor character. He does, in a sense, save her, the little girl, but not their, mm-hmm. not their family not, and not the family dynamic or anything like that. He's actually, yeah. he develops a, a sort a small bond with her, but then he's still like, I have to move on because I'm not, this isn't where I need to be. I'm not meant to be here. I'm going to go through, but she, he does improve her life. Some. Okay. Okay. That's actually very helpful. And it, it, it ties to me apart from, you know, talking about the little girl in the family, the whole vibe check of the source material to the first movie. I, I feel like I understand that. I understand where that, mm-hmm. that comes from. This gets to one of my principal challenges with the, with the remake that I contend it was overwritten. There is a lot of story that they jam into this new movie, and I don't understand where the need came from to to add the the story of the the malcontent with the deal with the devil and the the you know now uh, Eric is on a mission from you know mm-hmm. from the devil from god. To, to, from god i wanted to say that but i don't think it was god <laughs> it was technically yeah, i believe chronos uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's the blues brothers yeah it's the blues brothers mission <laughs> from the blues brothers to uh to right this cosmic wrong that has this right. guy living for hundreds of years 
after having made a deal with the devil and stealing souls of the youth. So I personally found I did not need that. I found it it delayed getting to what I wanted the movie to be for too long. Am I alone? If I can suggest this, I think there's two ways to look at it. One is in terms of this movie and how it relates to the comic book. The other is how it relates to the first movie. Mm -hmm. And so let me talk on that first one a bit. We can respond a bit and then move on to the second one. Sure. One of the things that I think I loved so much about that first movie, and I think made it so inherent to goth culture itself, it's very much like in no thoughts, all vibes. Like there isn't backstory. There isn't lore. Um, We open with the scene of them being killed. Um, There's, for today's sensibilities, way too much of the essay that I would have liked to see, but like still, you know, that was the time. But, and then it's like straight into the violence and it's straight into the, and there's no, for me, one of the, there's a great um, sort of meme I saw a while ago that said, punk is the world is broken and I want to fight it, fight it. Goth is the world is broken and I see beauty in it. Ska is the world is broken, but I have an effing trumpet. Um, which I love is the breakdown of those three. And, <laughs> that and the, goth, the goth part of it being like, yeah, but there's still beauty in all this brokenness, but we're still aware of all that. Like, so like the, the bouncy goth, the happy goth, it seems like such a contrast, but it actually was a big part of it because a lot of it's mm-hmm. about how can we acknowledge the brokenness? And that's why, Ocean, I love what you said about how the killing is fairly random because that I think is a big part of it is that tragic tragedy hits so many of us and there isn't a reason for it. It's not because we're part of some big epic plan. It's because just stuff happens, you know? A bus hits someone, someone gets cancer and you never would have expected it. You know, these things, you know, you fall and you break your leg and and healthcare destroys your family. And so the movie having just this kind of like the utter beauty of the ridiculousness, because I think that's the other essential part of goth culture that a lot of folks don't really understand is that it, it takes itself seriously, but in a like, we're taking ourselves so seriously that it's not really serious. We're kind of laughing at our, there's a very self-deprecating nature of it. And so to me, like the defining image of that movie is when the last big bad, who I think is Guy of Gilborn from um, the Alan Rickman yeah. Robin Michael Hood, Wincott, right? Michael Wincott, yes. Okay, thank you. He has this fight with, with the crow on the roof of a church and he falls and impales himself on a gargoyle. And all of a sudden, all the blood that's apparently running down his body at an incredibly fast rate is coming out of the mouth of that gargoyle. Beautiful. And it's, to me, that's the idea. Like, it's not supposed to be realistic. None of this is supposed to be realistic. And that's why it's not supposed to have a moral. It's not supposed to be that he's a good person for doing this. The, the good, I think the best thing he does, as I said, is to help get that mother off drugs and put her and the little girl back together. And that's kind of accidental to everything he's doing. Um, so yeah, so just, that's from that perspective why I think the, the underwriting of it is a really essential part of what made that first movie work. That That's interesting that that we would say that and i think that part of that kind of leads into my point from the intro that i wanted to get into which is that juxtaposition between a comic book movie in the 90s versus a comic book movie to to today and i would challenge you all if you wanted to see it again it doesn't sound like you want to see it again so i'm not actually going to advocate for that but the concept of the overwriting here or the concept of the slow pacing or the boredness that you felt in there to me, really felt like a breath of fresh fresh air when I'm comparing it to superhero movies today, in that much of what's happened as we've accelerated through more and more superhero movies, and especially in origin stories, we tend to accelerate all of the parts that would be story to some sort of shorthand because we kind of understand what heroes are. And if you watch the original Crow, we were getting some of that too in 1994. It was like Matthew said, it was beautiful to say it is all vibes, no meat. I don't remember what you said. 99.9% plot free. Right. So there, that felt like potentially something new in 1994. And it and it brought something here. So now we're getting into this sort of, especially in origin stories, even comic book movies that I love, like Shang-Chi, for example, or something where we're just getting quick hits of quick, quick plot, quick background so that we can jump into the story. Well, this movie did not do that. This movie sat on the relatively short but meaningful love story (laughs) you know between these two flawed trauma bonded people and uh, got into it but gave us the story between them gave them the the conversations between them that allowed well at least for me to take the leap with them and say 
that this was a meaningful thing to them. And because they were two broken people, to be able to take that leap and for Eric to be able to make the commitments that he makes later on in the film, I really sort of believed it. So I get this sort of juxtaposition of what I expect a comic book movie to be today. This subverted that. And it didn't do it in a completely negative way for me. I expected to be more shorthand. I expected it to be that way. And I actually appreciated that they took more time with it. Now, we can argue whether they did it well, whether they executed it well. It sounded like you guys didn't feel like they executed it well. I bought into the whole thing and I was along for the ride. And then when it got fun uh, later on, I was laughing with it because it felt so much fun and interesting when they started getting visual. So, yeah. So that was the thing that I thought is I think that both of them work in different ways as yeah. contrast to what's out there today. I think my real problem with this is that they called the movie The Crow. And so there is a piece of it where it's that. So at the end of the day, The Crow is a known commodity. It is it is a thing. And so if you're going to make another movie called The Crow, you should not betray what The Crow actually is. It is similar to all my quibbles with the James Bond movies, which I can go in in great detail about the Daniel Craig ones because they don't count. But that aside... And you're the, objectively uh, wrong about that, just, just that, for the that record. Aside, that no, I'm, I've, I've, I've really always been correct, but that's, 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 that's not matter. Okay, that aside, <laughs> the, the problem that I had with, the, with this, that piece that uh, people talking about The Crow is... Their motive in in the crow story, there is a motivation and in effect, the love and the relationship between Eric and Shelley is what is driving what's going on in this movie because they had basically this demon that lived for a hundred years and then you know the I don't know the talisman from the river sticks uh, that said, hey you're gonna we're gonna send you back uh, you know to do it basically now what you really have now is that instead of Eric being a driving force, he's really a pawn in a bigger game. And so he's just being used as a tool, similar to a gun, and just aimed at a thing. And so even though what he is doing has this side effect to their relationship, it really isn't the driving force. The driving force really in this movie is the the guy in purgatory and then the demon and their battle with each other. And even them being proxies for assumably God the devil, right? I mean, that's really kind of what we're looking at here. And so so he's, he's uh, relegated, Eric is relegated to just you know, just another foot soldier as opposed to the driving force of what is happening before us. Uh, Ocean, I completely agree with you there. And I think kind of to respond to both what you and JJ were saying, I, I want to be clear when I talk about how much I love The Crow, the original, I think it is a great movie. I don't think it's a very good movie. <laughs> and I don't think a million others like it should have been made. I think um, it was a perfect encapsulation of that time and place. And that's part of, I think, why like those of us in that subculture loved it so much is because it was kind of ridiculous and it was way over the top. And I remember one of my thoughts was this movie seems so perfectly suited for the late 80s, early 90s. I don't know if it would translate. And, and Ocean, I love that you brought up James Bond for that exact reason, because I, I do like the Daniel Craig movies, but I think you're right. They're very, very different. They're not really at all what Ian Fleming had in mind. Because I think at the time Ian Fleming wrote, our society had a view of a manly man who kills lots of people and sleeps with lots of women. And our society has fundamentally changed. And today, like for a lot of folks, we can't see that and root for it. So we have to look at it, as more, and it because the societal mores have changed so much. And it, I, like, I, I feel like that was part of what happened here. In part, that's the, like, I don't think just a pure vengeance plot would have been okay anymore. I think they needed it to have some higher meaning. They needed to set it in this larger story. And JJ, that's where I think we differ the most because there are a lot of movies where I can watch it the first time and hate it, but then when I divorce it from the IP it claims to be a part of, I can love it. There's a great heist in space movie that I really love because it is just a heist movie with space and action. It happens to be called Solo. I don't think it has anything to do with Star Wars. There's a really fun knights and armor and romance movie called First Night. It has nothing to do with King Arthur and Lancelot. Um, and I think Ocean, that's what you're saying about like, if, if to me, if this movie had been called something different, I would have been interested in it. But I think the last part is all those movies, I could find something to enjoy. JJ, you were saying that this movie has too much of like, uh, the original just noted these things. This one tells it. That's not what I got because I could see a whole movie about two people who meet each other in the most broken of circumstances and find love together. I could see a movie about 
this broken purgatory place. And Ocean, what you were just saying about this battle between God and and whatever the purgatory is. Or I could see a movie about like this demon worshiper who's killing people to keep like, and the movie indicated all three of those, but it didn't actually tell me much about any of those three things. And I feel like if it had wanted to go deeper and really went deeper on one of those three, it'd be great. But trying to go deep on all three of those, it felt to me it never got beyond surface level. What's What's interesting to me about it is this movie, you know, opened with the, my experience of it opened with the trailer to Joker, Folia Du, and that relationship, the Joker, Harley Quinn relationship is the relationship I felt like they wanted to give uh, Eric and uh, Shelley, right? Like broken people coming together and finding something in each other that that they connect Except on. These are protagonists and those are antagonists. Yeah, but still, they look more interesting than what I got in this movie's relationship. Frankly, I found, uh, I love FKA Twigs as a dancer, and I'm not sure this was great material for her as a performer. Um, I really struggled with the performance. I really, really, really did. And so it made it hard to see somebody uh, of the capacity of Skarsgård and really believe that he had fallen in love with her. Hmm. And and part of that is because as an audience member, I didn't fall in love with her. And in romance movies, you kind of have to fall in love with them both to buy it. And I, I, I couldn't. And so I think the relationship that they put into the front end of this movie it, it, to that end might have been too much for me because I was I ended up too disinterested in it by the time it got to the actual action savvy savvy parts. Right. Like. His purpose was maybe, you know, come on, dude, maybe you should just lay down. It's fine. Bad stuff happens. Well, wait, <laughs> I wanted wait, him to wait. just sign it off. Did, did you guys really? think they were, yeah. they were trying to make us believe it was a real romance? I did. Yes. Was it not? I, yeah. Oh, I trying, thought the whole point was that he was like incredibly broken, self-hating, and she was too to some extent. And so what they had was like never he healthy in the slightest. And you're supposed to think of it as a tragedy that continuing that cycle he's still in this place of wanting to just utterly destroy himself to save her out of that same like like and to me like like joker and harley i think there's again a similar like this is not a healthy relationship and that right. one is often much it's, more like one is abusing the other but wait a minute matthew it's the it's the fact that they that to them it's real it's not like it was a joke yes. or it was it was a fake out for us as an audience to them it was a real experience whether it was rational good or broken doesn't matter. And the movie, in the story specifically, teaches us over the course of the film that she is broken because she's been corrupted. She is a good person who has been corrupted to be broken. This broken person chooses to give his soul in exchange for hers so she can live the good life that she deserved to live. It's actually a very powerful story, whether you believe in the love story or not. When you talk about the idea of good and evil, this is someone who is broken, who chose to give his life for her in an idea to redeem himself and give her the redeemed life she was meant for the entire time. I, these are all concepts that I loved, and I did like her in what she did, too. So it, it allowed me to get there. But that idea is is really interesting when you consider that, of course, they met at a rehab center and she went there to hide. He went there because he had to, right? I mean, like, I don't know. I, I think that the story, the characters are actually pretty deep if you allow them to be. Yeah, I, I guess I never saw her as broken. Oh, I think that she was literally corrupted in, in the video. He, when as soon as we see her be corrupted, and it's figuratively through his devil speech that he whispers in her ear and her eyes go back and she stabs her friend. And that's the whole point of what he says to Eric is she's not the person you thought she was, is she? Because they're all trying to convince her that she is evil when really she's good. And his whole pact with the devil was to take good souls and corrupt them to give them to the devil. So what Eric becomes is the redeemer in this case by righting all the wrongs. I, I, again, I, these are all things that I really loved about the story. So See, I, <laughs> I'll I, just say. I, I think where I struggle with this is, and this gets to one of my biggest problems in the movie, it felt like none of the female characters had real agency in this movie. And and one part's because I don't know 
again, here's where I feel like they lamp po- lampshaded the story, but didn't actually tell me. I don't know if when he whispers in their ear, he's fundamentally corrupting them for the rest of their life. Or if it's just like a brain mind control for 15 seconds, because normally they just kill themselves. She's the only one who we see live after he's done that. Except also there's this other woman character who apparently was mind controlled by him. And then her mother was also mind controlled by him. And the stand in for the young girl who they decided to make older and sexy for some reason that I really didn't like just dies in the first 10 minutes. So there was like no female character who I felt had her own agency. And like, I love the story you're telling. And it is entirely <laughs> possible that I was sitting there going, why is there sunlight in my goth movie? And so I missed it. <laughs> but I, I, I don't feel like they told it well enough because I was left so confused of, is she, because the other thing is, like you said, she didn't have to be there necessarily. So it felt, her whole relationship with me felt very, with him felt very uh, manipulative at first with me. Then we figure out her own brokenness, but I don't know, like, is she corrupted entirely after that? Was it just 10 seconds, but now she's back to normal? That's like, fair. And I do have a history of not knowing when I'm being manipulated by manipulative women. So that does make sense. <laughs> but <laughs> in addition well, to that, one thing that I would want to say look, about We all grew up at the time not... of Offspring, Self-Esteem is a song. <laughs> we know it well. Yeah. Right. So um, one thing that I would say about women not having agency is I totally agree with you on that point. And that is a carryover from the 1994 film. <laughs> For sure. Who, Where there was even less agency in the field. We only got Shelly as a as a flashback, right? Like right. It, it, that was bad news. I, I literally said to my wife, if the character begins in the fridge, is that better <laughs> or worse? <laughs> worse. I'll just answer that for you. It's worse. It's, it's worse. Sure. It's settled. Yeah. I, no, I'm not I, sure I, on that I, point, but that's another one we can discuss later. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I agree that uh I, I I agree with I agree with uh, with them that uh, JJ, you're uh, you're the story you're talking about sounds great. I wish that would have been made as a film and then called something else. Um, but yeah, that that was I, I didn't get that at all. I, I also I didn't even get her as being broken. I just got it as like okay, she did a like I didn't realize she was the one that did the bad thing in the film. The pacing of the movie doesn't tell you what happened in the film, right? So the effectively or passages of time how long ago did this happen i don't really know let's assume inside of a year but then that means that this happened she went on and lived her life for x number of days months after that just fine saw the video then kind of freaked out and then went to the you know bumped into the cops with a bunch of cocaine on her so she could get put into rehab but i just i never never felt corrupted it just felt more like she was just trying to make decisions to stay alive and so you, you know i mean yeah they you know, so they did this, but I, and I think, and maybe that part of it is that I did, I'm not seeing the deeper meaning in it for uh, the, those multitude of reasons. You know, some of it could be what, what Pete was saying, where I, I didn't fall in love with the, with the actors or the characters or anything like that. And also I, I did find myself a little bit stuck in, I, I, the movie did a poor job about demonstrating the passage of time. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't sure from when they met to when they died. You, you know, and I was asking people that I went to theater with to see this with was how long, how much time do you think passed? Like, are we talking like a, two months, a month, a few well, a that, week, a couple weeks? Like, what do we, you know, like, so how did they have all this massive love when it's like, didn't y'all just meet like last week? Yeah. And it is really tough to understand that. That is one of the problems with the film is that early on when they're passing back and, and you know, they don't explain to you who Dom is versus the other persons. They, they introduce Eric before Dom, even though she's calling Dom, which is kind of confusing and that sort of thing. Time is an issue. But that's one thing that I will say is also a carryover from the first film in that time is squidgy. Right. And they play with it that way Um, in it feels like for me, it felt like it was on purpose, but I can definitely feel how some story elements were lost because of that. I would say I would I would counter. I don't think it was I don't think the original film was as squidgy as this one. Right. Like the event happens. They die a year later. He comes out of the grave and then everything happens pretty linearly. Yeah, I think they specifically say it happens within 24 hours. And and so that's that was the thing like this movie, I, I feel like there isn't there are a couple of montages that play with time and come out of the montage in an uncertain present that that I yeah. think can can be confusing. I think that's yeah. my that's where I take it. And this is a really interesting thing. Like here we are with a reboot of this movie that gives us more. And this may be the problem that I'm bringing to it. And I think what you're talking about, JJ, is I, I take it. Well, like I, I understand, I came into this movie with the baggage of already having an origin story of the crow, of Eric Draven. I already have it, and 
they gave me so much more origin story that I already had, right? Like I already had the sense because I already had the vibe. And maybe that's part of what I found uh, difficult to, um, to adapt to and, and what caused me to just be bored because I felt like I could see around every corner. Well, I could see every corner. And, and I guess that's just to add on to that, at least what I'm, what I think I hear you saying, cause I'm, I was thinking something similar was because it's the crow, the story doesn't start until they die. So yes. when they're showing me this romance, I'm just sitting there waiting. Like, well, when do they die? When do they get killed? Yeah. Like when, when does, because to me, that's when the story starts, you know, all this other stuff was just, you know, yeah. so they really could have done it on flashbacks. And so that was my, I, I found that that also helped that also hurt me as far as getting invested in their relationship because I, I, because, because of that, because I am thinking, okay, we're not at the beginning of this movie yet. I, I mean, I'll be honest. I spent the first few minutes of the movie, like, again, some, sunlight just threw me so much because it's so against the aesthetic of the first one. <laughs> but even more, when there's like this boy on a farm with a horse, I literally thought, did that's, they start playing a preview by accident? Or did no. I, I'm like, am I literally in the wrong theater? Because uh, I showed up, like, um, I, I ran into the theater, like, it, you know, the previews were halfway through. I was late. I literally thought I was in the wrong theater because I was it. just like, what in the world is happening here? Yeah, that's a scene from the book in a sense. Um, it's a, it's a it's a hodgepodge. So in the book, there's a scene where Eric is on a train and a white horse like that runs into a barbed wire fence and gets killed. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that that he's saying in his head about all that. Um, mm, but so okay. it, it was like a it was like they just took a pa a panel from the book and said let's let's do this part of it. And then the the, the whole boy and then I guess he burned his mother's house down. I, I'm assuming the drill yeah. he burned it down. You know, all that stuff wasn't a part of the book, but the the horse was. And I think they just took that for some reason like i couldn't understand why i, I would say I find it, go ahead i find it thematically interesting that we do need and i i mean are the the scars on his hand as important in the book but uh, like i feel like we do need the scars for the character as a symbol of sacrament right like that's that's something that means something beyond what it just is and giving us an origin story of the scars was uh, to me, that was a powerful opening. Sorry, JJ, I cut you off. No, I agree with that, too. And I think it's a good point to say that the, one of the interesting things about the first film is that the story begins with their death. But I would challenge you on that to say that if you made a film with the first third of it being the majority of flashbacks today, I don't think it would play as well as the flexible minds that we had in 1994. I think there would be a lot of complaints about that. And I mean, the concept of us buying whether or not they're in love is completely on the fact of we spent time with them. And so we're calculating the time they were together. Where in the first movie, they just told us that they were engaged. So we created an entire story by ourselves in the first one to say they were in love. Whereas this one, we're judging the story that they told instead. So I don't know. It's very good point. Very it's good an point. interesting way to look at the two things there. I, I mean, one of the things that was coming to my mind is that this movie seemed to think it's better to tell than to show, because that's yeah. the thing is, if you just show me two people who are engaged, I assume they have a healthy relationship. <laughs> if you show me their relationship, I now feel like I have the ability to say, OK, I don't think you're showing me a healthy relationship in a way that like, you know, because you're asking me to buy into it rather than just telling it to me. And I think that's one of the things that I also kind of liked about that original movie is that Eric is kind of an everyman. He, he's an everyman who's part of the subculture. He's in a band, but like, he's not, he's not like a huge rock star. They're playing at like local bars. I think is the sense he gets. They're not, they have money, but they're not rich. He's just a guy getting by who has this tragedy happen to him. And then instead making this, him this incredibly broken figure with all of this tragedy, I, I guess, cause a horse died. I don't really understand what the connection they were supposed to be, but like it, it othered him in a way that I didn't like, that I felt like I, I connected much more to the Brandon Lee Eric. I, I want to I want to make a point about making the movie, making a movie where the first third is flashbacks, just just one point, And it starts with a bunch of bands. Um, it starts with uh, drop pairs and fat fat gadgets and uh, in excess and crowded house and spirits of the air and Fleetwood Mac. And yes, and. Cock Robin and Rick Springfield and Mike Oldfield and uh, and Rick Springfield again and Crowded House again and Cutting Crew and Joe Jackson and Alphaville and a lot of Sting uh, and uh, those are all music videos directed by the great Alex Proyas, director of The Crow, nineteen ninety four. You put The Crow today in the hands of a filmmaker of the caliber 
of Alex Proyas as a as a feature film director, I think he could get away with telling the story and modernizing the story. And I'm saying just like the hypothetical Alex Proyas who would do a remake of his own movie. What we have in Rupert Sanders is a guy who did uh, what he's the crow. Obviously, he directed one episode of Foundation, Ghost in the Shell, uh, Snow White and the Huntsman and The Life. And there are a couple other shorts in there. And I feel like what we got is a Rupert Sanders movie. And what I wanted was an Alex Proyas movie. And I don't really, I, I mean, we can litigate the the substance of the script and the changing tone and the vibes all day long. I just don't think he is yet the caliber of filmmaker that we had with the instinct of an Alex Proyas. And I think that is something that I'm finding I'm suffering through because I had higher hopes for this movie. And, and I didn't, I didn't get the team. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I, I, I would argue that uh, in his development, this is probably his best thus far. Man, you're talking about Proyas? Are you, are you slamming no. Proyas right now? No, nice. I'm saying this of Sanders <laughs> growth. Oh. Yeah. 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 I'm talking well, nothing about the old director. You. I'm talking Snow, about this one. Snow White so, and the Hudson is a 6.1 I'm on IMDb. Ghost in the Shell, 6.3. The Crow, 4.7 today. You like it? Is we saw eight. Ghost in the Shell together. We didn't like Ghost in the Shell. What no, we didn't. I'm not saying I liked Ghost in the I didn't like any of those movies. I thought okay, Huntsman okay. was bad. That's my point. Yeah. That's, yeah. My, that's, so what, then, that's my point. We have a same, but we're in violent agreement <laughs> again, JJ. Yeah. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, ask, I want to I want to ask Jay a question because I want I want to be uh I, I want to be swayed in some way and I was just curious. Then, yeah. um, since we talked about the love story and all of that, the the journey when he becomes the crow and his what he's doing there, you know how he I think he fails the twice and then he, he gets it the right the third time. So how did that hit you? So then, since if if you were okay with all the love story at the beginning, then when he becomes a crow and becomes in a sense vengeance. Did, did you feel that he was justified? Did you feel that it was not justified? Like, was it good? Was it bad? Like, what was your impression of that piece of the movie? Well, what I loved about it was that line that you didn't like, which is that the enemy of love is not hate, that it's doubt. And that as the lore, and again, I probably need to divorce this from the IP as well, right? Because if I can look at this as an independent story, and I look at the lore here, and I t think about how the story came through, and how in each of those times, he learned to doubt really what he had brought him there and given him the power in the first place. And then he makes the turn at the end when the crow or, you know, the, the, the person in purgatory says, it's okay, you're done. You didn't do it. And he says, no, I'm going to go further. I'm going to go deeper now because it matters that much to me that now he gives him this increased power. I felt like that was complete. I felt like that was consistent and a great telling of the story. But again, separate from the understanding of the first one. There was some point in the film where I let the first one go. And I like the first one a lot. I watched it again this week, just leading up to this. I think it's great for its time. I really like this one too. And I feel like that story works for me. So then is it fair to say that you, you viewed his journey as one of where he needed to shed his own doubts about his relationship? Shed his own doubts about love itself. Yes. About love itself or his ability to be loved? Both. Yes, I love that. Okay. This, is, this is just turned into one of my, yeah. I'm not saying you guys, this is not my therapy session, but <laughs> you're doing it for me and I love it. <laughs> okay. Well, if it's going to be your therapy session, it's also going to be a little bit my, my own podcast of ethics. Let's talk about Let's the villains it. for a bit. Yes. Because, and here I'm not, I'm not trying to say, oh, the other original is better. I'm just trying to set up what the, I think the original is doing the villains and then compare it to this. Um, I mean, we go on kind of a weird detour, but we're all kind of people of a similar generation. Although, as someone who podcasts with a podcast called Generation, specifically to bookmark the fact that my two other podcasters are in their 20s and make me feel very old, I don't think I've ever been the youngest person on a podcast. So thank you all <laughs> so much. Um, even if I only have You're like nine months to be in JJ. Are you yeah. 77 or 76? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you're, you're welcome to get off my lawn. <laughs> well, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. 76. Um, but my point is, do you guys remember the role-playing games, e either or Vampire the Masquerade or Shadowrun? 100%. I do not. Because to me, okay, so they, they both had this idea of kind of mixing, I mean, in Vampire, they specifically called it gothic punk. That everything was a little bit more punk, but also a little bit more gothic, and a little more, everything was a little more extreme. And Shadow punk, Shadowrun was similar. And in them, I think one of the things that really conveyed, and then I thought this, the original got so well, is the idea that it looks like what you're dealing with 
is random chaos. You know, just your your bank card gets declined because something terrible happens. You're you get hit by a drunk driver. All this stuff, and it's entirely possible. And and the hilariously ridiculous, just like yeah, yeah, pyromania, woohoo! Like that's the main villains. Mm -hmm. But in a very blinking you miss it way, there actually is a much more like corporate overplot of that the reason why this guy is encouraging all these firebugs is to burn out these tenements so that he can rebuild. You know, it's like a Donald Trump, you know, very kind of like real estate-y tycoon kind of thing. And that to me is very much what I think of is like random chaos, random people, you know, but all controlled by a corporate overlord. And to me, that's, that was very much a statement of that, but also in a like, you don't have to care about that. Like it was only until the third time I watched the movie that I realized in the original, Shelley is trying to organize the tenants, and that's part of why she gets targeted. Um, in this, like, they're demon worshippers, I guess. Like, I, I didn't, because the movie told me so little about the metaphysics, like, I still don't understand why he has to sacrifice himself to save her. Um, but even putting that aside, is the villain supposed to just be generic, I want to live forever, so I'll sacrifice everything, and there's just no, there's nothing interesting there behind that? Or was there something I'm missing? Oh, I think it's just inferring about the Hollywood pedophilia ring, but you know that's uh, what I, I it's literally so, what I was thinking about. I did like, not think I did not think yeah, that. I like I mean, that in my head that because of the fun. arts and like this yeah. whole thing of like this guy who lives forever has all the money, has all the control, and taking these young innocents and forcing them to do things that they don't want to do. Like that's exactly what I thought it was pointing at the entire time. No, you to, uh, to me, you just nailed it. You gave him okay. more more purpose. That makes a lot more sense. I be, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. And I didn't I didn't love it because I felt like one of the things that was so great, uh, you know, we we're talking about the first movie. It's grounded in that sort of random violence. It's very much, um, uh, although less so, uh, it, you know, bring up the Joker again as the antagonist. It is just chaos, no backstory, which is why I hate it when they give the Joker backstory. Um, and th this like even adding the corporate malfeasance to the first movie is is just a. a little bit too much for my taste this the 2024 movie it's I, I felt like they tried to give me so much of the infrastructure like maladaptive mm -hmm. infrastructure and i missed what you just said i missed the the other cultiness of it that he was part of something better or, or not better <laughs> i scratch that part <laughs> of something bigger uh and uh that that he he was running this sort of agency and it stood for something in the real world that makes sense to me. Well, and I just see them all as symbols, right? I mean, that's the thing. And an interesting thing about the first film is even with the corporate and the very grounded story that we have about burning out tenements to get in there, yeah. we still have the hints at the supernatural with the sister who he's having the relationship with burning people's eyes. I mean, there's, there's still this sort of symbol of something bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bigger there. And so this this flirts with that as well. It, it, it yeah. It's a different thing, and it's a different thing in the way that it's expressing it. But I definitely saw that and was uh, interested and terrified by it. I, well, I, 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 we, we, should, we should call him Jeffrey Epstein, and suddenly yeah. it makes sense. <laughs> I, I will go. say that was would it? explain what I said at the beginning of why they aged up Kenzie and made her a teenager um, instead of just a preteen, like a, a, a cause I think she's supposed to be like 10 in the original movie and she's like 15, 16 in this. Yep. You, you mean the, the, the Kadzi or whatever the, 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 the blonde, yeah, I want to go. I, that's why I keep forgetting her. your name. It's not Kenzie. Okay. It's Kadzi. I think is the yeah, name. Yeah, Kadzi. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The, I guess the, the, the thing to me though, with that, which, which I'm still trying to get at symbolism aside, I, in the, in the book and in the movie, I understood what the villains were and 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 to some degrees i understood why they were trying why they did what they did um the one area where which i i will just briefly say as an aside that i i don't like about both movies of juxtaposing the books is both movies indirectly make it shelly's fault they got killed and in the book it's nobody's fault it's straight random and so and i, and I think that that's part of the power of the story but in this though i did not understand in the new in the new crow why are they trying to kill her? I, I just, I never really understood that. Even when you see the video, it's like, okay, so he whispered something in her ear, she stabbed someone, and then he, you know, consoles her. 
And so, and I was like, a dude with that kind of money and power, look, any lawyer can get you out of that. So like, what do you, like, you know, it's not really, there's a reputational risk, I guess, maybe, but other than that, not much. And so it's like, why are we killing them? And why is all these people, uh, this de- this determined to kill her? I, I don't understand even why they're, the rest of the people are doing what they're doing. So I don't know, do you see something there that I miss, like why they're doing it? My only explanation for it, and it might be too much of an apology, is that it potentially shows a documentation of the supernatural and that it would get the wrong people to question if it were released. And so they really, it wasn't so much that they wanted to kill her so much as that they wanted to destroy the documentation and then all of the violence happens because of that. But that's, again, that's in, and that could be too much of an apology for, to get there, but that's, that's where I went with it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. I, we're, we're cruising toward, our our finale um i want to talk about crow character design and uh, because i think they made some interesting choices here uh especially we've already talked about some of the the fashion choices that they made in the original crow and i'm curious your take i think uh, ocean i'd like to start with you uh as uh, as a probably i'll say maybe the deepest aficionado of the books um what do you think of the adaptations from print to today well the look of eric himself really in both cases works uh the uh in the brandon lee version it worked because he you know he he looked the more i guess the dress was about right his athleticism was good you know all that was that looked the same bill skarsgård actually physically looks more like him because eric draven in the comics is is very tall um and mm. so then you know he looks very much like it and on, honestly i thought he really pulled off the look well uh you, you know so everything about him aesthetically that way i i think worked the 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 main differences aesthetically that I would I would see as far as when I talk about the the way they did the design of things is that this new one looks a like it's a bit more of a modern world and it, it's a more it's much more affluent. Uh, the the crow both the original movie and the book are dealing with much you know they're they're all pretty poor you know they're poor low it's low level crime it's mm-hmm. not anything big this is a very high uh, affluent world that they're that they're in now and so that part is a little bit uh, i think changes some of my perspective because when you have that level of afflu- affluence that means you have a level of resources beyond what is you, you know be, beyond kind of what we're seeing as far as these low stakes games that they're playing when they're hunting people around and and i think that to me that's probably the biggest shift was the amount of money in terms of you know he's in the opera and he has all these companies and all these resources and all these bodyguards you know because like the, the the opera scene which was fun i mean what was that 30 guys you, you know so like to have mm-hmm. that many to have that many yeah. guys you could just throw at somebody uh you know to then have them fight and then all the other goons i think that that part of it to me aesthetically it was very it's very jarring and very different and and so it makes it where he's effectively the crow in the new movie he's climbing a cro- corporate ladder or, he, or he's getting to the big boss in a different way uh than in the book and the movie where everybody he's killing, he's doing it just because they d- wronged him directly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, I totally see that. And I think the opera sequence is, is a, is definitely the, the a signature scene for this movie, especially because yes. somehow all of the goons replaced all the opera staff. There's just like nobody giving out programs anymore. And I, I, that, that was, I thought a uh, nice flex on, on behalf of our big bad. Um, I didn't I wasn't as crazy about the look of Skarsgård's face. I wanted I, I wanted a little bit. I, I don't know. Does he in the original do his eyes connect to his mouth with the with the black? No, no it's, yeah, it's more like the left and down. It's more straight, straight up and down. Line, straight down. And then the oh, smile. and it's up and down. Yeah, they have like pluses. Yeah. 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 I, th- I thought they made him look ridiculous. <gasps> I, didn't, I, I thought he looked ridiculous. You didn't like I said, whole, and what about oh. the sequence where you have the intro to ready or not, but never going into the lyric Yeah, and get, Oh my gosh, like okay. preparing yes. for battle. Oh my gosh. It was so good. I was literally excited with tears. I was standing up for the new movie. <laughs> I, I awesome. did like, cause I saw the promo pictures and I was like, where's my white pancake makeup. Right. And and then they, I saw how he came that look. And I was like, like, I liked it. I having known a lot of people who were the like, like, even at my worst, I was talking to everybody. I was never the super withdrawn person. But I've known a lot of those folks. Most of them, in between the mental trauma and the writing and the drawing and the 
resisting everyone else generally don't find time to do a thousand crunches a day. So I don't <laughs> quite get how he gets that body. Um, That's an Ozempic uh, body for sure. I think, but like, in terms, if I can make character design more about like the character than the aesthetic of it, I didn't like this Eric. And I think part of it, again, forgive me for taking on the more ethical side of it. There's a fundamental goodness at the heart of the Eric in the original. He does want to, he, I mean, he's, it's a goodness of that okayness. Like he enjoys torturing and killing these horrible people in a way that I thought it was a really, it, it's a kind of like, it's a guilty pleasure of like, I, I am against the death penalty. I don't want bad people to suffer, but God, it's fun to watch Desperado or this guy do it. But also like he tries to save people along the way, like, like Kadzi and her mother and all that kind of stuff. In this one, First of all, the goons, I'm always a little iffy. Like, I want to know that all those guys are in on the plot, you know, the, the devil worshiping thing. Or else I'm kind of like, are these just rent a security guys who are all getting killed? Uh, that's not really cool. But more importantly, think about the other people this Eric meets. He meets Dom, who is just as tied up in this. And Eric is just kind of like, oh, well, you're a dick. Okay. And then we just walk away from him and have no idea what happens to him. And then he goes to like the tattoo artist guy who's sort of playing the role of the cop from the original, but not really. And like the guy is there and gets killed while Eric is just like, well, yeah, I just don't really feel like I can fight. And it's only until he finds out that, you know, his uh, love, I say in quotes, but other people buy it. That's cool. But um, is in danger. Her soul's in danger that that's what awakens him. And I'm like, dude, the guy who has been helping you just got killed in front of you and you did nothing about it. To me, it's yeah. part of why I also don't believe that it's actual love in any way, that it's just to me like, like not psychosis, but like a desperate person grabbing onto anything they can while they're in a very bad mental place. But it just, it, it made it to me, him feel very selfish of like, this is the only thing he cares about, to hell with everyone else. To, I don't, I'm not going to ask who these other people are, why I haven't killed them and get in the way. I, it, it was much more self-focused in that way, whereas I felt like the original Eric is just a better person. I agree. He's kind of like a straight edge goth in the first movie, right? Like that's what's what we got, you know, and then this guy is a little bit more broken. But I will say about the scene where he's that is the scene where going to the part about doubt, that is the scene where he gets the doubt. So when he doesn't fight, that is the moment where he believes he's human again. So he doesn't fight because he believes he's human. And then when he comes back, when he decides to take the big step, that is that part of the movie. So I bought into that. And I actually believe that he that he did care about the friend. I just don't think he could thought he could do anything. But but I totally understand your reading of the situation as well. I never understood how he had a friend. I thought he had a friend by way of her. Like they weren't really friends, but she was friends with him and the TikTok of that whole thing doesn't make sense to me. Like, I mean, first off, the body part, I just took that because I was under the impression he was in the institution his whole life. Um, I, I wasn't, oh, like, yeah, I, I, I was from, because he, the, he starts as a child, and the next time we see him, he's an adult, an adult in the institution. So I just figured he was just there the whole time. Yeah, I, he, I thought the death he, horse just fundamentally broke him, and he was in right, there. Right, right. And he burned the house. He burned the house with his with his mother in it down, or the trailer down, and then he they institutionalized, and he'd just been there his whole life. So that, that to me, explained the body, because I was like, well, what else has he got going on? Well, then what was the scene when everybody was trying to get him to fight him at the beginning as part of the therapy? Why would they have done that? Like, I guess that was informing me of the fact that he was running with a bunch of guys and was doing a bunch of things and doing bad things. Like, um, that's what I believed I, there. But I just thought that it was bullying on a prison yard because he wasn't talking. Yeah, I didn't right, think that was part of it. How was that part of therapy? Did I miss something? No, it wasn't therapy. It was, it was at the very beginning. These guys were bullying him. Yeah. yeah. But they, they were, were trying to get him to overcome his desire to fight. I don't think it's good therapy, but that's what they were trying to do because he was such a bad actor that they were trying to, that he was in a place where if he was to act badly, that he couldn't, that nothing would come of it. So they were trying to push him over the edge and he was trying to show his discipline in that regard. That's really interesting, JJ. I can totally get that read. And I think it's from a, a, a production standpoint, from a narrative standpoint, it, I didn't get it because I don't think I ever got a sense that he had trouble holding it to his, onto his rage. Like maybe had I seen him have to overcome that, like by losing that battle and actually fighting, it, it would have made more sense. Totally fair. Uh, yeah. I think um, there may well be a universe in which there's a five hour director's cut 
which goes into all the more detail and we all have to bow down to jj as just slow. seeing like all the things we missed because like the story you're telling jj i think would make like a great four episode miniseries you know <laughs> or six episode miniseries like give me a whole episode about how eric gets to be who he gets to be give me a whole episode about the villain make give me better actors for all of them but um you know then i think we could have had a, a much better story well a better script for sure i i think that the the other thing okay wait before okay yeah. well, we can't jump off a script because okay. if we're talking script and you really watched the 1994 film just recently you cannot criticize this script because the language that they use in the 1994 script is utterly ridiculous it is it's like it's ridiculous on purpose it's so bad I, I've been talking too much. I'm going to put myself in the queue that I have a lot to say to JJ, but I want someone else to go first. <laughs> I, I I disagree. I disagree what? with that. I I actually think the script is Are more than just about the dialogue. Hair right now, I. I mean, do you want? Is that our relationship? <laughs> no, but that's now? the point. Like all of the, all of the like, literally yeah. all of the things they call each other. All of the exclamatory statements are all utterly ridiculous. No one's ever used the language that they used in the 1994 movie. Right, so, right. And also it's about a guy coming back from the dead thanks to the spirit of a crow. So okay. I, I, yeah, like I'm okay. I, I, I also feel like in that era we had uh Robocop, very similar. Robocop yeah. is is a classic, right? So yes. I, I kind of got with it, but what I uh I, I mean I think the the script and the production of this script is troublesome because sometimes I literally think that they had no script and they just said, okay, sit on the couch and start improvising because mm. scenes would start with, so what's your problem today? And yeah. I, I mean, they're just, they, it just felt like you're bringing me into a rehearsal and I didn't see any character. And I really struggled with some of the, particularly I, watching Skarsgård interact with the secondary characters. Speaking on that, I, I found that my problem was with the story and I'll, I'll use Dom as, as my, as my avatar for where I, where I came, where I, where I had issues. I felt that I was surprised to find out that this wasn't just a complete reshoot. I felt that there were two different stories that they were trying to smash together. And the reason why that, and this is just a, a small thing, but this is kind of where I, where I am. Dom, in the story, Shelley calls Dom before she gets arrested, and then uh, you know, hey, they're onto us. They're going to find us. Hide, get out, run. Okay. Then then she goes to the facility, meets Eric, has their entire love story. Then at the end, they show two things. One, Dom shows up at the club that the club that they're at for some reason, and saying, Shelley, we have to go right now today. Now the problem I had with that was, well. Doesn't that mean Dom's been hiding for however long this has been, this last six, eight months? Like, what's the what's the urgency and rush today? You have you have successfully been hidden. So you really shouldn't be all, like, hot and bothered about trying to leave. And, and so him saying that, then I, I didn't understand that. And then, uh, then after that, right after that in that scene, she says, let's go back to your place and we'll talk about it. And then they escape the facility together. How does he have a place? Wouldn't they be living together? They were never separate from that point on. So then I, I just felt that at that point, I said, okay, I think that they shot two different movies and they're just trying to smash them together or something. Because yeah. because I just, I could not make sense of, and I wanted to give everybody the benefit of the doubt of making this movie that you wouldn't make a movie this logically coherent on its own terms. And so therefore that I felt that is like, maybe they shot one movie with some director or some, you know, someone else and then another one and then try to put them together. But then everything I looked up, I couldn't find anything that happened. And so then that just blew my mind that you would have, a, 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 you would create a story that forgetting the lore, forgetting everything else, if you try to just let me make sense of it on its own terms, doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I had one of those like comic, like I sat up straight so suddenly that I almost spilled my popcorn at the let's go back to your place. And I, I, that didn't make any sense. We never got an explanation of why does she have this rich friend who has this really nice place. And like, like there were three different explanations I could give. I think though, I, I do, JJ, completely agree with you. The script of the original one isn't good. It's great, but it's not <laughs> good. And, and, but let me say more. I, I think, and yeah. forgive me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do more on like sociology of 90s goth. I think one of the other movies you have to understand to really get that idea is the Tim Burton Batman. Because that movie is very intentionally yeah. a comic book movie. Yep. And it's not MCU comics. It's not trying to say, what if this was all in the real world? It's saying, this isn't New York, it's Gotham. And I feel like every, 
in, in the Vampire and the Masquerade book I was talking about, the source book, it says, imagine if everything in the world, all the punk and all the gothic was like turned up 20%. And yep. that's the crow. Yes. Yep. You're not supposed to believe any of this is possible in our own world. Everything is affected. Everything you are is supposed I, to believe it in that world. So oh, I, I love do. that. And so that's yeah. my point is that what this, the 2024 film is, it's, it, is it's an MC, MCU movie with that sensibility. But with, then you have we're to going have better back dialogue. To you, with, we're going to go back to your place, but how does he have a place? Like all that stuff. They didn't care in 1994. They didn't care how those things happened. But right. It's with that sensibility, but now it's in the way that the movies are made today. For, for me, and that's what I, the point I was trying to make is to bring it full circle is you were saying that we can't critique the dialogue of this without acknowledging the bad dialogue of 94. I'm Fair. saying 94 wasn't trying to be a good movie. It was mm -hmm. trying to be a, a thing, like a very specific kind of, this is trying to be like, what if this really was happening in our own world? And if you're going to do that, then you have to explain why he has a place. You have to tell me, you have to make people sound like they're people, not like they're bad improv actors, as, as Pete, you were kind of yeah. getting at. I, I, I see how, how you would say, I definitely at no point tried to feel like this was how it was happening in this world. I felt like it was all a symbol. And then that's how I bought into it for that mm -hmm. sensibility. But I understand why you guys would feel the way you do too. I definitely want to rewatch it. I, I want to rewatch it going to a movie called The Raven. I'm going to tell myself it's called The Raven. Because <laughs> yes. um, really, none of us, no one really knows the difference between those two animals. We always mix them up. Uh, and in the original, he quotes Edgar Allan Poe. For exactly. the idea. So I'm going to call it The Raven, and, and maybe I'll really like it again. Well, I'll, I'll see. because I just And maybe the follow-up, The Crows Have Eyes 3, The Crowning. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's Greek knockoff. <laughs> Um, I, I okay. remember this is not my podcast to run because normally I would just uh, kick my group, kick one of my uh, people out of the group for a few seconds. <laughs> you will kick like nothing. <laughs> Fire it up. Fire I, it up. Fire it up. <laughs> Fire it up. <laughs> they say clothes make the man, but out here on these rain slit streets, they're a shield, a statement, a second skin. This. This is no ordinary garment. This is armor forged in the fires of loss, stitched together with vengeance. You can practically smell the gunpowder and hear the whispers of the fallen. You think you're ready for this kind of commitment? For trench coat commitment? For the weight it carries? The shadows it embraces? No, this isn't about some cheap imitation leather jacket. It's about something more. It's about joining a flock, becoming a part of something bigger. Wait a minute. You're not an agent of vengeance in a trench coat. You're a hero podcast aficionado looking for a tribe. That's why you need to head over to truestory.fm slash join and join the community supporting the next real family of film podcasts. Get bonus episodes and content, early access, a standing invitation to join the live stream chats when we record, ad free versions of our shows, and access to the super secret channels on our Discord community. Mostly, you'll know you're supporting our shows and the team that keeps them coming every week, just as we've been doing since 2011. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. I find this movie so interesting, uh, partly because so much of the 80s tied to, to, I think, shifting 1980s and 90s worldviews, right? Like just the, the post-punk kind of goth uh, aesthetic running into social issues and discontent and, and disillusionment, disillusionment and gyre, desire for like independence and justice and, and all of, of those things. Don't trust authority. Don't trust infrastructure. And yet also transitioning toward optimism, toward this sort of um, neoliberal control over our own lives. That's what so much of The Crow, um, I, I think, represented uh, to me as a as a kid. And and I'm not sh I'm not entirely sure that the supernatural's kind of fantasy elements were as much a nod to today's worldview in the remake of the movie as it is to, you know what, Stranger Things is popular. Like we should, <laughs> we should probably make a movie that has more of that kind of stuff in it. Um, yet, I'm I'm going to say it out loud, JJ. You you've carried the load today, and you've actually earned my review an extra star. Oh, a what full do you think of or that? just a half? Uh, you know, uh, I'm no half stars, right? Oh, I, I, I don't do. Nice. I don't do half stars. Yeah, no. So I, I I'm thrilled. Thank you guys, everybody. And now it's time to rank it. 
Letterbox.com slash the next reel. That's where you can find our HQ page. All of the next reel family of film podcasts. We uh, we drop all the, the stuff up there and we're going to rate it now. And we're going to find out where out of five stars this movie falls. And I think to Matthew's point, uh, is it a great film or a good film or a film you love, even though it's not either of them? Does it get a heart? So five stars and or a heart. JJ, you first. Go ahead. Let's start high. I am giving it four stars. Wow. And I will say, just for your thoughts about when you when you think JJ gave it four stars, just go watch the opera scene again and just watch <laughs> it isolated. Because I want to say the thing I said at the beginning, too, because y'all know or you should know, I am not a fan of graphic violence. But that is the most fun with graphic violence I've had since The Kingsman. And it may I may like this better because it feels like it from an emo guy has meaning where that was for giggles. So I watch it and it's it it had the same effect on me as like the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones. It was oh. so gruesome that it was that it made me laugh in the theater like it was it was intense and they and it was creative and it was gory and it was all over the top and it of course it's not real. There's no way they couldn't hear it. There's of course there would be other people there, but it made yeah. for a beautiful film scene and if you just isolate it, it I think it could be as valuable as the Matrix walking into the elevator scene. Like, I think what? it put it in that category. <laughs> Just watch that and let go of all of your other things about this movie. Just watch it again and see what you think. Four Matrix stars. is coming back. Fathom events. Oh, yeah, I didn't watch the whole opera scene because the, the violence to me was so gruesome. I had to keep looking away. So maybe uh, that's why that's I didn't fair. love it as yeah. much. That's it's fair. it's gruesome. There are some incredibly creative uh, uh, uses and of a uh, katana. Uh, I too movie. laughed out loud yeah. during that scene. It's yeah. the yeah. only thing that my emotions could do. I, I did think, <laughs> I, I will say, stabbing someone with a sword that's through your body because you're yeah. invulnerable, that was a great moment. That and is into a their move. eye. Into their eye. Leaning into their eye with that. Uh, just not very, stop, creative. Stop, very creative. Very <laughs> creative. <laughs> okay. I don't uh, like either. I'm on your side, Matthew. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew gets a second to recover. Ocean, what's your uh, what's your review? Your rating? You know, there's there's an aspect of this that I want to um, uh, of these movies and book that I want to put out there. So um, when you said, well, we, am, "Am I goth or am I emo?" I said emo because I just thought of that in terms of that. For me, the story had the emotional impact. But from the culture standpoint, that you guys are both talking about most of the references you, you've been saying Pete, about the about the different bands and stuff like that. Are like I, I'd never heard of them. I, you know, I, I, I a lot of them I don't know. What, I don't know. I, but there's a lot of references you're saying. I don't know who you're talking about. I've never heard any of their music. Uh, there's there's none of that to me. That you because know, like even they're the, all sad even the, white people. That's yeah, what, even like, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Even even in the soundtrack of the Crow soundtrack, which I have loved, was listening to today, except for Rage Against the Machine and Nine Inch Nails, I'd never heard any of those bands before. I listened to the listen to this. So it so anyway, but that's and I just want to make see in, in couching it that way, uh and not that this that, that this wasn't a standard for me. I did not look at this and identify in it as in like it's anything about me or my personality but it was just an amazing great story and and that i enjoyed it on its own terms because that is what i was looking at it as it's like hey this is what you provided me these are your terms and so this movie on uh then that's the old movie which was great this movie uh, w went the opposite direction on its own terms it makes so little sense the story drags on so bad there's so many plot contrivances and there's so many things i can say bad about it up to and including this podcast is the only reason why i finished the movie i give it one star and no heart oh i thought we were coming in with one star and a heart because you were feeling gracious but I, no I no it. i've I not not only will i not watch this again i've already texted multiple friends and said don't watch this <laughs> don't movie go to see it. <laughs> okay all right uh matthew are you are you ready I was gonna say I, I've told all my goth friends from the, the back in those days that I want them to watch it, preferably like pirate it or so. I don't want it to get any money, so no one ever does this again. But in that kind of like, oh god, this smells so bad, you have to smell this. Um, I, and I, I, I will guys, admit, come look at this before I flush it. <laughs> I, I will admit I don't think I think this was a thankless job. I don't think you can remake this movie. Because I do think it is such a product of that time and place. And you're JJ, I think you're right. I think a lot of the the conceits of movie making that we were okay with in the 90s. I think probably a lot of people who didn't, see, you know, who are not, you know, grumpy old Gen, Gen Xers like us, if they saw it for the first time, would probably think this is ridiculous. 
I was sort of thinking there's a whole last thing I want to say about goth and emo, but I don't want to, you know, take over. But Ocean, I'm so glad you opened up that because I think it's a perfect way I can explain my the fundamental thing I don't like about this movie. And I, I remember that I looked at that meme again. One of the things that I, some of them actually have emo on there, which is that it that, that emo is kind of if goth is if everything is broken, but it's beautiful. Emo is everything is broken and I'm going to complain about it. And that is very much a grumpy old Gen Xer looking at the millennials. And I apologize. I think there's a lot of great emo music. But one thing I think that is missing, that to me, what this movie represents about that time and place more than anything else is finding joy and finding beauty in that. Like that scene of the blood coming out of the gargoyle is beautiful. Uh, and and the, the katana in the mouth is not. It is effective and it's powerful. And if you like that, it's that. But it's not, there's no beauty in it. And there's also, I don't, Eric had fun. Like he straps that grenade to the guy and sends him in the truck and you see him laughing about it. It's a sick, twisted revenge fun, but he had fun and he invites the audience to have fun. And I, I never felt Eric was having fun in this. I felt like he was in this horribly unhealthy loving relationship and then in this horribly unhealthy revenge plot and then a supernatural, like, and then he just throws everything of his life, of his unlife, whatever it is away for someone he barely knows. And, and even putting that outside, maybe it's not romantic enough. I don't know. But like, it, it, to me, it's a lack of joy. And I, I'm willing to give the Raven another shot. And I think I might give the Raven two stars. But the Crow for me is very much, yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, I do do half stars. So I'd probably say it's a, it's a half a star. Ooh. And the half a star, if it was not the <laughs> opera scene, it would just be zero. Wow. Well, I, okay. Before you I, start. Yeah. I want Matthew and Ocean to go watch Silent Night. <laughs> I, 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 it is I, unfair. It is unfair to give movies one stars and half stars if you have not seen Silent Night. I, I have seen Silent Night. <laughs> oh, did you like it yeah. better than The Crow? Well, yes, because I mean, let's face it, Silent Night was absolutely totally ridiculous, but it it, it was stayed it stayed ridiculous on its own terms, and and everything about it was kind of like you know, I mean, look, I liked it better than The Crow, but I mean, that's a really low bar. Right. Wow. You know, so there's, you, you know, the, the Silent Night was was silly and stupid and, and totally ridiculous and implausible and, and everything. But at the same time, that's what it was doing. That's mm -hmm. what it gave me. It isn't a movie that I'm going to watch again. But if if you said I had to watch one of these two movies again, I'm popping in Silent Night. Oh, my God. OK, I'm taking oh over. And I think I might also, mute Ocean. Uh, I would absolutely I watch Pro. Yeah. To me, it's it's so low, not as much just because it's bad. Because yeah, they're much worse movies. I suggested this podcast to begin with because I noticed that so many of the movies of the '80s and '90s were being remade. Like this mm -hmm. year, there was a remake of Go Monsters, which fine, that's legitimate. Roadhouse got a remake. Um, Cobra Kai, which is all a remake of of like there's so and I hate I like some of those things, but the overall the remaking culture I hate and despise. And I yeah. want this movie to be an utter failure and all the critics. I want Hollywood to learn something from this and to say, we will not destroy beloved cult classics of the past. We'll just let them be and we'll write our own stuff. And now I'm going to get yeah, very passionate and I apologize. Uh, it just felt like it was pissing all over my childhood. So <laughs> zero stars, half a star. Half a star. All right. Uh, Ocean, one star. Me, uh, I came in and I already wrote my review. I already wrote a one star review and I'm going to change it. I'm actually going to give it if I if I did half stars, it'd be one and a half. But I'm going to have to because of my stupid rule that I set up for myself that obviously I have no agency over. I'm going to give it two stars and I resent that a little bit, but I'm going to do it today for JJ and I'm going to watch the movie again for free when it comes out streaming. I mean, I'm not going to go to the theater again. I'm not a, a masochist, but I, I will watch it again. Um, I think one year later is important. So I will watch it one year from its release date. And then that is a fantastic, the fantastic way to look at it. I think it yes. will probably be streaming in 45 days. I yeah. think I will wait even beyond that. Yeah. Well, uh, so while it did not improve my rating, I am, I am eternally impressed uh, with you, uh, JJ, in that I, I, I normally am the lone voice, dissenting voice in this. And it's really hard when we're like, no, this is horrible. And here's why, you know, to stay, to stay positive and say you like the movie. And I respect, so this, I, I, like so this, I am Eric Draven, this Eric Draven, and your negativity cannot <laughs> stop my love. It fuel, in fact, it fuels him. It fuel, exactly. Do you see it? He's glowing. I choose love. <laughs> I, I, 
but there's no love in the movie. <laughs> okay, yes, you're starting okay. a new Don't thing. We're yeah. wrapping it up. Yeah. I'm calling. I, it. I will Put say, JJ, I'm it. now very intimidated to have you on my podcast because I do think you are the smartest person about movies that I've ever met, or you're oh, completely well, deluded. You. I don't know what it is. It's probably a little both, but because the you. movie you talked about sounds great, I want to yeah. see that movie. Yeah, I, I honestly want you to make it. I want you to go call them up and say we're going to redo this. We're going to do. We're going to do JJ's version. Can we of the get you to do a commentary track? I like Star Trek. I would watch yeah. the movie with you making a co- if you record a commentary track. I would watch that. We'll do that. Well, and I would say to your point, JJ, I would watch a different Skarsgård version of this movie. Uh, uh, all the live long day. Uh, I I thought he actually he was good. All right, we're done. What are we doing? We're still talking. This is we're done. <laughs> we have symbolically <laughs> signaled where this show is over. Thank you everybody for hanging out with us. We sure appreciate you, your time and your attention, and mostly thank you Matthew for having this idea to bring us all together and duke it out. Uh, great, great, great to have you over here. Uh, and JJ, thank you for <laughs> for moving your entire life to a new echo-free environment just to show up and carry your love uh, for this movie. Appreciate it. And Ocean, as always, great to see you. Make sure everybody goes to check out uh, the other podcasts that are hosted by these people. Well, the film board for JJ, he's already here. Matthew with Star Wars Generations and the Superhero Ethics Podcast is brilliant. And Ocean, the Adrian Moment. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I, I think that might be the greatest sports movie ever made. So I really <gasps> want to see that. Whoa. Oh, now we really, we're going to have to have I a reaction podcast that. to Ocean's it's podcast yes. about yes. this. Yeah. Because, be yes, at, 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 yes, because as a teaser, we opened with a conversation of, is Invictus a sports movie? <laughs> right, right. That's, oh, Ocean, yeah. I'm going to listen. That sounds so good. I'm so wait. glad you're doing it. I can't, can't wait to wait. hear your perspective. Thank you, everybody, for downloading. Yeah, we're probably not going to leave this call uh but i'm gonna stop podcasting about it (laughs) see you all everybody meeting adjourned